Today's episode of the BS Podcast brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor. The easiest way to shop for the best tickets thanks to their revolutionary grading system. Buy and sell tickets in just two taps on your phone. Two taps. Everything fully guaranteed. House, did you know that my listeners get $10 off baseball tickets the first time they use SeatGeek? Did you know this? $10 off in just two taps. Let's do it. Use promo code BSMLB. Download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek.com. We are also brought to you by Miller Lite, the official sponsor of TheRinger.com. Brewed not only to taste great, but also to be less filling. Only 96 calories, it won't fill you up. It's brewed to be enjoyed from tip-off to final buzzer. The original light beer, and has been since we first showed up courtside in 1975. By we, I mean Miller Lite. I'm on the team. Uh, And finally, we are brought to you by Larry Wilmore's new podcast, Black on the Air. Cousin Sal's new podcast, Against All Odds. And Joe House's podcast, Shaq House, which is going to be talking about the uh, Tiger Woods thing today. I might ask you about that when you're on this podcast, too. Uh, Here's Pearl Jam. We are going to start it up. All right, in studio with me, Brian Curtis, editor at large, TheRinger.com. On the phone, Joe House, uh, longtime BS Podcast Hall of Famer, host of the Shack House Podcast. A lot going on today. House, I know you're talking about Tiger uh, on the Shack House Pod, but let's talk about it with Brian Curtis for a second. It just made me sad. I, I don't want Tiger to be involved in memes. I don't want to see his his mugshot face floating around on these different. Uh, internet things that get sent around the world. They, this is a sad ending now. I, I, I derive no joy whatsoever from this. Not one drop for me. The, None. Yeah, if you look at the, the word cluster, uh, isn't that what the, the millennials do these days? They create word clusters based on what stories, what word appears in stories. Yeah. The most predominant word, the word that's, in, that's gigantic in the middle in all caps is sad. Every, every single story that I've seen out there from the golf uh, commentariat, uh, as well as, you know, the, the broader sports uh, punditry at large, you know, everybody's observing how sad this is. Um, there are a couple of curiosities. I think as the story kind of develops, um, there will be a couple things to kind of focus in on. It was slightly weird to me that it was important to him and his statement to say that alcohol wasn't involved. Um, and instead to sort of, you know, posit that it was um, the, the combination, uh, an unexpected reaction to the combination of, of prescription medication. Not sure that's much better. Yeah, and, it's like when you're asleep at your car and you're so incapacitated that you can't drive, I don't really think it matters what's running through your blood, just that you were that incapacitated and you had to pull over. Yes, yeah, so, and the other thing is 3 a.m. I mean, what... what uh, World Wide West. What's the World Wide West rule? Don't chase the night. What's Don't your, chase the night. What's your take, Curtis? Is there any athlete we have gone through more emotions with than Tiger Woods? No. I mean, now we've reached this new thing, right? I mean, who, who else in American history have we hit all these things with from the pure joy when he started Yeah. to kind of wishing for him to fail to the affairs to now this when we're saying oh we can't even we can't even take joy in this we're just purely well, the, sad that it's what like, who, who, who else who else had that the many only one stages? bc that i can come up with is oj oh yeah <laughs> that just made me sad <laughs> jesus but I, but I don't even think we with oj well we had the extreme yeah <laughs> murder portion of his <laughs> career very extreme Extreme. Um, I don't think we had the the sort of slow wind down, uh, the breakdown of his, you know, his body, the the affair thing where it's like, you know, all these horrible feelings that we have for the guy are coming out of the box. You know, the press conference thing like Tiger had. I mean, he seems like he seems like a guy who's been lost now for eight years and he was a golf machine forever. And then golf got taken away because first his body broke down. Then he had all this personal stuff. He couldn't quite get it back. His body broke down even worse. In these last five years, he's, he seems sad. House, I know you've talked about it on your pod for the last year. And you, and you guys were in the corner, you and Shack, Shackelford, about here it comes. He's coming back. This time it's going to be it. We all wanted it so bad. Every single sign from these last four years said that this guy's body had broken down. 
and it was not coming back. Did you really believe he was ever coming back? Yes, I did. The performance that he put on in December at his own um, little event, this um, you know charity event, the, the Hero Challenge down in the Bahamas, um, where he went out and shot the best round of the day, and I can't remember the number off the top of my head. It was either 65 or 66, a bogey-free round where you know he was rolling in putts uh, unexpectedly from all, all kinds of different lengths. And he had that that uh, hop in his step, and his look um, was was you know super focused. I thought that that was going to be potentially the launching pad into um, a spectacular 2017, in the sense that he was going to be able to play a couple times a month. And then January rolled around, and he missed the cut at Tory, but you know it was only a couple holes that undid him. And then he got in the airplane and flew to Dubai which probably in retrospect was a mistake. Uh, now, I know that there was an appearance fee uh, incentive there and, you know, reestablishing himself on the world stage after signing brand new ball and equipment deals with TaylorMade and Bridgestone made a lot of sense, but um, the dude stunk in his first round uh, out there and then he just withdrew because the weather forecast through the rest of the tournament was bad and at least the next couple of days and you know it was clear he was you know walking awkwardly out there on the golf course and he blamed some of it on you know the the, the jet travel so uh, yeah that was how really many, it how many back surgeries four four now yeah i mean i don't think anyone should ever get back surgery unless they're just completely incapacitated i think steve kerr would agree with me on this i don't know how bad tiger's initial situation was but um just doesn't seem like it's a great list with the back surgery. Then you throw in his plant knee, the right knee. That's the knee that he had to have all the other surgeries on. Once a guy gets operated on, I don't know, nine times, that seems like a lot. That's my biggest fear with Blake Griffin. Blake Griffin's 27. He's been under the knife all these different times. And, you know, I I, I feel like we should have seen this coming, and, I, and, and we kind of didn't want to see it coming. Right, Brian? Oh yeah, I mean, we're we're when I talk about emotions, we we're rooting for the comeback. I mean, it has, yeah. and the only reason I think it, and I'll defer to House on all matters of golf commentary. Yeah, but it has to happen, right? Even if it's just a rando tournament, yeah, that he comes back and wins, you know, like a colonial, like we had this last week. I mean, it just feels like it has to happen. It's the sports. It's the next sports story. It's a sports movie. How are we not going to get one more moment to be like, oh, Tiger, we love you, buddy. That was great. Are we, is it really, this is going to be it? Mug yeah, shot. usually it either you have the sports movie comeback or you have the complete flame out. And this was really neither. This was a slow, steady fall to where we ended up on Memorial Day, which somehow was the second holiday that he's had issues with. But um, it, it was like this eight-year, steady, slow march to this point. Not you wouldn't wasn't it, w- it wouldn't make a good documentary. I don't think it's wouldn't make a good sports movie either. It's, it's in the middle. I don't know what it is. That's and I think that's why the emotions are so heightened because yeah. we're all struggling with it. Right? There's no sports movie. The music's not swelling. Here right. he comes, Ben Hogan, Boop. back from the car accident. Right? Right. We got it. We got it. We got it. Now it's like we don't we don't know what to think. Yeah. Well, that's we're we're. we're Hopefully, if you're a glass half full kind of guy like I am, especially when it comes to the Tigre, hopefully we're in the the you know the wistful montage. You know, he's a lot of long looks out the window while it's raining outside. He's on the train. He's in, he's he's working out uh, on the treadmill. He's he's lifting weights. That's the montage here. And you have to remember, he's only 41. You can be good at golf in your 40s. There's lots of guys who are good at golf in their 40s. Yeah. The forecasted timeline for him to come back after this last surgery is, again, like November, December. So he could play again in this event down in the Bahamas where he kind of wet all of our appetites again. And so, again, if you want a glass half full it, you don't have to throw the dirt on the coffin yet. Yeah. I think it's really tough for these guys when, they, when they've hit a certain point that only a few of them have ever hit because MJ's had his own issues. You know, we, I mean, you think of post MJ after retiring, then he comes back Oh two and Oh three, then he retires again. And, and 
really struggled to find that same level of competitiveness led to that crazy hall of fame speech, which was the first time we all kind of looked at each other and said, Oh wow, this guy's in kind of a dark place. And I don't know when, when you've reached heights like that and you are just the OG tiger hit heights that I'm not even positive. LeBron has hit. Like in my lifetime, I, I feel like it's Tiger, Ali, and Jordan were the only three I ever saw got to that kind of invincible level. Maybe Brady after this last Super Bowl, where just everybody agreed, wow, we're never seeing anybody like this person again. Yeah, and Tiger hit a mystical stage yeah. that, that yeah. LeBron never hit. I he, mean, won no, a, he won the US Open nobody, with a torn ACL. Nobody said LeBron is Gandhi. Right. But you could almost well, was, believe it with yeah. Tiger. You could almost believe that's it. That's right. I mean, there was a moment when it was le- a legitimate conversation about who is more popular or more uh, well-recognized, not necessarily popular, Tiger Woods or Barack Obama, kind of worldwide. Who, ha- who, who, who do more people know? Do they you know, know Tiger or do they know That was Barack? 2008, right? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think when that gets pulled away from you and you've been disgraced the way he was after – the uh, Thanksgiving incident and he loses his family and, and the the one he never says really anything interesting in interviews. And I I think he's managed to be a a closed book for his entire career. That one time with the Charlie Pierce profile in like 96, 97 and he he let loose and Charlie ran some of the jokes and that was it. Tiger closed the door. Um, He, the one thing that I gleaned from these last round of interviews was he just kept pushing his family how important his kids were, how, oh, I want to be, I love being there for my kids. I drive my kids. And he just kept, was kids, kids, kids. It was like, he was like this lost guy. This was the one thing he could grab on was that he was a dad. And don't forget the Santa Claus tweet, right? Where you had the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. the little beard. He also, Alan Shipnick from Sports Illustrated had a tweet over the last 24 hours where he said Tiger was just kind of coming out of his shell a little bit because probably because he was so desperate yeah, and was kind of, giving a little more to journalists and being a little bit better. And you could see him kind of like thinking, Oh, I got, I got to give more because nobody but it was cares. A strange choice of journalists, right? It was, Ship, I think it was actually Shipnick, right? In the, in the, in the last big sports illustrated. Oh, that's piece. right. Yeah. Yeah. That was, so that was, that wasn't strange, but there was another one. Like he was very revealing. What, what magazine was, was that? Golf? I think oh, it was time. time. Yeah. Time magazine with, and then there was another, I thought it was like, what was it house? Like a, it was a foreign magazine, right? I thought there was one he gave. I don't remember. He did a thing with Wright Thompson also, or maybe Wright Thompson did a piece. He he didn't do. He he conspicuously year. didn't do a thing with Wright Thompson. Yeah, yeah, he didn't. He was. Oh, it was like, yeah, right. he did, did not do it with him. Wright. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I don't know, and I and I don't know where this goes for him. I, I I agree with House. I think it's weird that they were so adamant that it wasn't drinking. Like that's a worse sin than all these meds, and it was like. He was on meds. I, I had a friend of mine emailed me today who was like, uh, I, I've done some drugs. I've never heard of three of these drugs. Like these were like heavy, heavy prescription drugs. And it makes me wonder like, you know, how, like, is it going to come out? He had like a serious prescription drug dependency. Ooh. Because, right. That's that's what's kind of the background here. Yeah, because you're talking about somebody whose body was in a lot of pain. I, I don't want to speculate on this. I'm just I'm guessing like if it leads to the point where you're at on your in front of your wheel asleep on the side of the road at three in the morning, you have a bunch of different prescription drugs running through you. That leads me to believe that over the last six, seven years as his body broke down, you know, if we're doing Mad Libs, sad tiger thing that happens. Yeah, that would be the obvious one to put in. Right. Next. Absolutely. Prescription. I, I, I've been addicted to the Brett Favre period. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it happens. Exactly. And it's happened to a lot of people. And you go from, oh, my back hurts, take this, to oh, I'll take eight of these instead of four. And oh, I'm going to take 16. And it spirals. And it would certainly explain, you know, a lot. But as, as House said, he's only 41. I can't quit Tiger. It's like, it's like broke back off mountain. I can't quit Tiger yet. I, I oh, still no. feel like, I still feel like this, maybe this will be the wake up call. Maybe this will be the one that gets him back because the skills are, they, no matter how much your body is broken down, the hand eye is still there. And we saw Nicholas win the masters in 86 with like a broken body, basically in a pot belly and he'd had back surgery. I mean, 
it's not inconceivable that this can come back, but man, it feels, what would you put the odds house? Oh, not, not great. I mean, the other thing, I'm glad you mentioned Nicholas. He was 46 when he won that masters, I believe. Yeah. Um, but in any event, yeah, odds of, of coming back, eesh, 15 to one at best, I would say 15 to one to come back and do anything. Well, I, I to be relevant again on a weekend in, in a, in a major that mattered. Oh my God, that's much higher than fifteen to one. Relevant in a major, because that that the the amount of work that has to go into that, but the lead up to that. I mean, we were just wanting him to play competitive tour golf this coming yeah. season, and he had invested all of the time, and all of the signs were good through the balance of two thousand sixteen, all the way up to the moment where he shot that bogey free, low score of the day. Again, it was only against nineteen other competitors. At his event down in the Bahamas, was like, okay, this is the thing. We watched the round. Um, he 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 scrambled around. He hit driver well. His his length was there. He was hitting the ball as far as any of the other guys. So like, this was the the marker to demonstrate that he's gonna, you know, he can go ahead and compete again. But like, competing in a major is a whole other animal. I mean, the odds of that are like that's fifty to one, I would say. Uh, we're taking a quick break to talk about credit wise by. From Capital One. You know what? Numbers are great. Whip, war. How many masters did Tiger win? What was he up to? Like, was it six? He won at least three. God, you know somebody's great when you can't remember how many masters they won. Anyway, on their own, numbers don't tell the story. Credit isn't any different. With credit, it's all about how well you perform against the factors that go into a credit score. How good are you at paying your bills on time? How much credit do you have spread across different accounts? How long have those accounts been open? All those factors impact your credit health. And since there's no one single score that lenders use, knowing these factors are key, CreditWise lets you track the factors that make your credit health using information from your TransUnion credit report. The app can help you spot errors or identify theft, lays out information you need to understand your behaviors and how they impact your credit health. Plus, you can check it anytime without negatively impacting your credit. And the best part, 100% free for everyone, whether you're a Capital One customer or not. Step up your game. Download CreditWise today. La last note on Tiger. Um, if the, if this is 15 years ago, I was thinking about this cause Frank DeFord died yesterday. Obviously we're going to talk about that. That's one of the reasons I want to have Brian on. If this whole saga happens 25 years ago, Brian, how is it, how, how, how is the coverage different? How is our perception of what's going on different? Who, um, I think this story is pretty much the same. This part of the tiger story. The uh, the the mug shot, we don't probably see it quite as much 15 years ago. It's not as easy to see, certainly 20 years ago. Yep. Pre-internet. It, it, it wouldn't become, it wouldn't be passed around in that quite that same joyous way that that mug shot was passed around yesterday. I think his previous thing is the one that would have been really different because that would have been, it would have been interesting to see how much the the respectable media really touched it. We would have probably heard yeah. from one one or two fewer Waffle House waitresses than we actually did just because of some of that stuff burbled up through tabloidy kind of things. It would have been harder to it would have been harder to know just how how big his affairs were and to get all the gruesome details. I think this part would have been pretty. I think we've been dealing with DUIs and, and that this kind of basic arrest pretty much the same way. Yeah, I agree with you. I the O nine one, I went back and read this stuff I wrote about Tiger right after it happened. I did like a giant Tiger mailbag and it was interesting rereads. Just the shock from back then. I, I think now that it's been a solid seven and a half years, it's it the impact of of what happened and the fact that we've been dealing with this version of Tiger for a really long time. Almost the entire Obama presidency plus part of Trump. Um that the shock of that that night and the downfall and the weird press conference with his mom there and all that stuff seems like it was 40 years ago. I actually think that press conference is one of the most interesting parts of it because yeah. how many times with a giant athlete, especially tiger level giant, do we get to see the real guy? Remember at the time we all said, oh, he handled the press conference wrong. He said the wrong things. But what we now know is that's the real tiger. Yeah. That's how he thought he should handle it. And to me, to get a shot of the real person reacting to something that that story that's just blossoming out of control like that one was, that's amazing. I mean, that was Tiger. Yeah. It still is Tiger. 
That's that's the guy. We got him. Not the guy in the Nike commercial. Not the guy who's smiling and talking to Jim Nance after the Masters. That was Tiger. And that was the first, you know, Twitter took off before 09. But 09 was the year Twitter really took off. That was when everybody started. Everybody had a handle by the end of 2009, basically. I think I I think I launched mine maybe in uh, April of 2009. Um, but it was 2009. Twitter started to push news. And that was, I think, the first major sports story I remember finding out about on Twitter. Being like, whoa. I remember where I was. I was with my <laughs> wife. We were having dinner. It was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I remember what restaurant we were at. It was like, whoa. Oh. It was like Kennedy. Oh. Get, it was like Kennedy getting shot. Two thousand and nine. It really was. House, do you remember where you were when that happened? I do. I mean, that was at the super, super height of my all-time Tiger lust. Yeah. So, <laughs> two two big sport moments that that led to like real gut wrenching, crestfallen. Uh, Len, the news when I woke up when I'd heard that Len Bias had passed away. Yeah. And then just the surreal. 48 hours of this of the the, the tiger um news and and it was a moment back when it was it was hard to still to get like instantaneous kind of news out of uh, the, the twitter cycle it wasn't quite as robust as it is now um so there was tons of i i think we had probably a half dozen telephone conversations back then about you know all the iterations and possibilities oh that, my god that, that, that went into that and the conspiracy theories, because that was a whole other part that after it happened, it was like, why did it happen? What happened? You know, it was a, it, it really was like from a conspiracy theory standpoint, one of the most dissected incidents of the entire 21st century so far. And a technology thing, too, because it involved his phone. Yeah. And text messages. It was kind of like, yeah, it was a very that was a very 2009 thing to be undone by your text messages. I remember the split screens after we had the press conference of his his tooth, whether his tooth was colored differently than it was two years ago, whether she had knocked out. Right. I mean, it was insane. <laughs> it was the internet at its at its best and and at its worst. But man, like I was thinking the Tiger Run, which was basically do you count when you think about the Tiger Run? Do you count the Junior Stuff House? Of course, I guess you. Oh could. yeah, it's all part of the legend. <laughs> So it's it's if you go with that first uh, amateur open that he won, which I think was ninety four, and that goes all the way through oh eight when he wins the open, and then oh nine was Wei Yang I think in April, or PGA June. That was the last. The PGA is, would have been in August. August, yeah, yeah. For so the that was, Yang. So that's a fifteen year run, and then it's over. And well, Le he, he Le won Bronze five had, times in. He won five times in 2013. No majors. I don't remember. You have to go back and look and see yeah. sort of what the uh, narrative was for why he, might, he competed. There, he, he was one of those years. I think he made the most money of anyone, right? Maybe that was 2013. That was 2013. He won player of the year in 2013. Yeah. It's kind of like the MJ Wizards thing where it's like MJ scored 20, 20 <laughs> points a game on the Wizards. <laughs> wasn't that sad, though? No, it wasn't. Tiger didn't have the pot belly. I, M- it, MJ it, was MJ was a stocky. <laughs> Am I wrong that I think more fondly on the MJ Wizards thing than most? Yes, because okay. I don't think you were fondly. definitely wrong. Okay, because I remember there was just, no fond moment. I remember him. Nah, there were a couple. I remember him coming to Actually, Boston. Yeah, a couple I went times. to the very first home game. It was very fun. He came to Boston once. It was awesome. It was like this whole new generation of kids are like, oh my god, that's Michael Jordan. It was pretty cool. Well, speaking of Michael Jordan and Tiger. Uh, the finals are starting on Wednesday, and it was it was a rare treat to just have nine days of of uh, speculation and wondering and people trying to create hot takes, and then you could kind of see where everything was going. You knew Le- LeBron versus MJ was going to be a thing. We had fun with it on the podcast last week. Now uh, it was the Warriors are going to blow them out. Now it's starting to creep back to. Oh, well, maybe Cleveland. Maybe people are counting out Cleveland. It's like, well, you're the same people who, who just told us the Warriors are going to win. And everyone's just bored and waiting for the finals to start. But ESPN.com had this thing on their website yesterday about whether this was the most star-studded finals ever, which I just reflexively wanted to throw up when I saw. And then I saw the case laid out, and I was like, holy shit, yeah, this might actually be <laughs> seven all-stars. This might be the number one. It doesn't have the most Hall of Famers, but... Uh, you're you're deferring to Lakers-Celtics from the 80s? So that my question is, do we want... Are, are we 
grading it on all stars or are we grading it on on future Hall of Famers? Because it's really hard to top Larry and Magic, two of the best five or six ever. Kareem, the th- third or fourth best ever. Worthy, Mikhail, Bill Walton on the bench, a bunch of iconic role players. Uh, Dennis Johnson is probably the 60th best player ever. Like, you know, I, I would still put 87 above all of these, 85 or 87, but I don't know, seven all stars? It's an interesting media question. Because yeah. in the 80s, those big guys seemed so different. They The guys seem really big now, but they seem big in a different way in the 80s, yeah. in the age of television and Sports Illustrated. Yeah. And, it, you know, I hear people talk about 80s basketball and they're like, everybody was an all-star back then. There's no all-stars. There's no stars now, which is obviously garbage. Yeah, it's not true. But the bigness of those guys is different than the bigness of the guys now, just in media terms. I can't even, I don't even know how to describe it. Well, there was a distance with the old, with the old the guys in the 80s. These guys now, it's like they're in our lives 24-7. Anytime they do something in a game, I'm either watching it or somebody's telling me it just happened. We're just tired of them. Because we don't have Maybe. to watch a tape delayed finals on CBS like we did in the, yeah. <laughs> we did in the early eighties. Yeah, the uh, the, the J- like magic to me. I've I've said this before, but I don't know how many times I watched the eighty four Lakers that year before the finals. You didn't they, hear Dick Stockton been, do a call. Might have been five times the whole year, and then in the playoffs you got to see some. But like House, remember. When we would see West Coast teams, it was really exciting. I'd be like, oh, oh, that's that's what James Worthy looks like in a Laker uniform. Like, we wouldn't even find out unless you were watching Sports Center and they showed him doing a dunk. And now it's like these well, guys I, are just in our lives. Part of our romanticizing that those teams from the early to mid 80s um, is also attributable to, to the fact that they were pioneers, right? They saved the league, they rightfully. Yeah. Um, have been recognized for saving the league. And I like the comparison to kind of the era that we're in now because we're, we're, this is also kind of a pioneering era with what um, Golden State has managed to kind of perfect in the way of reinventing um, the, the game with a 3 and D approach and having exactly the right personnel for it um, and adding in KD this current season. I wonder if 20 years from now people will be looking back at this era and you know, romanticizing what the Warriors and and then Cleveland as the perfect foil, right? I mean, it's it's been a terrific three years here with Cleveland and Golden State back and forth and the intrigue and which um, skill set is is the one that's going to carry you to the title. And they've split the first two, so I, I you know I, I understand the the point uh, about you know we have such uh, immersion in, into the into the the daily grind with these guys. And I, I, for one, am so ready for them to start playing some goddamn basketball games. But, um, like, the, trying to put the historical perspective on it, it's a loaded finals. It's great. Each of the last three finals feel like they've been loaded finals. And um, we'll, we'll see sort of how it, how it feels 20 years from now. I, I look this forward one, to having this conversation with both of you 20 years from now. Yeah, I... I left that Celtics series, and I think I was bitter that I felt like the Celtics would have done better if Isaiah was there. I th- still think they would have lost. But I left that series thinking, Cleveland has some real flaws defensively. And when they play Golden State, those flaws are going to be badly exposed, and Golden State's going to win in five. And then the more I look at it, the more I read, the more I think about it, um, Cleveland has some real advantages. LeBron and Kyrie and those guys, they won a game seven in Golden State. I, I think that is the number one advantage in this series is that they already know they can win there. Like you have that, that's great. Look at how LeBron, how he's, it was different for him when he went to Boston after game six, 2012. Now he goes, he's like, I've won here, I'm confident. So that's one. Two is that Kyrie, I, I think really feels like he's better than Curry. I, I, I think he plays the Warriors and goes, I'm better than this guy. I'm going to prove it again. So you you have two huge player advantages. The top two on the Cavs think they're better than the top two in the Warriors. LeBron thinks he owns Durant. He's like, what is he, 18 and five against them, something like that. So you have that. Um, and then you have the Warriors have guys that I'm not sure they're going to be able to play, which is what I want to talk to Jarks about. He's going to come on later. But I don't know how Zaza Pichulia plays in this series. 
I don't know how JaVale McGee plays. The moment those guys come out, they're just going to ISO them and put them in pick and roll and just figure out ways to torture them. On the flip side, the Cavs are going to have guys that they're going to have trouble playing too. And it just seems like, to me, this series, the more I stare at it, it seems like a toss-up. And two teams that are going to be able to do things against the other team. Does that make sense? Do I, now I sound like the, the talking head is trying to talk everyone in the series but i yeah, feel I mean, that I don't, way and i forgot to mention I, wanna... mike, I forgot to mention mike brown Ooh. that mike brown thing's a real thing that guy's been <laughs> fired three times he's coaching the warriors now steve kerr saying oh, you, i'm you not pre- in it you you prefer Ty Lue? yeah i prefer the Ty okay. Lue lebron combo i think all lebron right, coaches right. that team they won a game seven in golden state with Ty Lue and LeBron. I don't know what Mike Brown is capable of. I watch game seven. I know Curry's hurt. I think they've they've been very diplomatic about how they've handled the Curry thing. But they were terrible in the fourth quarter of game seven, the Warriors. They just went one-on-one. They had real trouble stopping LeBron and, and Kyrie. And then down the stretch, the Cavs weren't even making shots. But um, And they still won. But I don't know. I just feel like this is... Uh, I, I, I hate... If I'm a Warriors fan, I hate that... The narrative has become the Warriors are going to beat the Cavs. It's not good. That's scary. That's well, not good. I I feel like I should be more generous and more gracious. We just had a wonderful three day weekend. We're all back to work. I ought not to get on and immediately start using um, less than gracious language. But I think you're a hedging pussy. <laughs> I think Whoa. the Golden State Warriors are going to come in and blow the doors off the Cavs. Wow. So the narrative that I like, and look, there is no, the, the analytics um, create wonderful storylines that suggest that this could be a very competitive series. On balance, most analytics favor Golden State. I think 538 has Golden State as a 90% likely winner here. They I don't have gold, any reason they, to disagree with it. What I like House. 538, is, is story. House. 538 <laughs> had the Cavs with a 3% chance of winning the finals on May 3rd. I just wanted to point that out. By the way, I bet on the Cavs last year, so I, I'm I'm fine with that. Okay. The only thing I want to say is I like this story of the Warriors redeeming the best record in the NBA, the best regular season record in the NBA last season, and they couldn't validate it with the championship. So what they're going to do this year is go 16 and mother effing O in the playoffs, the first time in the history of the National Basketball Association, and they're going to come on out and just do it to it. It's a sweep. That's my call. I like I'm going to gamble on that call, hmm. and and that's the, the one that I'm subscribing to. Curtis is stunned. Wow. We might have to get Curtis some water. The sweep? The sweep pick is really bold. I like it. It does feel like we're in the two-week break before the Super Bowl, and this is Wednesday before the Super yeah. Bowl, and we've just like, okay, what have, what have we not argued? Right. What what scenario are we? Is tomorrow Cavs sweep day? You know, we, can we Cavs talk ourselves feels into like that? That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way Curry's playing, and I think that's a huge advantage for the Warriors. Is that he's a different guy, and he's got his mojo back. And uh, Durant, I think, is going to be super motivated. LeBron's going to have to guard Durant. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait until tomorrow's BS podcast on uh, the Wednesday edition to give my finals pick, but I did want to talk about um, finals odds with you guys. House, you ready? I'm ready. I mean, this is the thing. I, I, I This is what the, the Durant, anchor of my I'm going to give you an album. Durant plus 200. LeBron plus 210. Steph Curry plus 225. Draymond plus 800. Kyrie, 12 to 1. Klay Thompson, 20 to 1. Kevin Love, 30 to 1. Nobody else is relevant. I think Kyrie is the... I, I'm not saying he's the best bet. I think the odds are the best for him, twelve to one. Yes. Because there's a if if the Cavs win, one of the reasons they could win is Kyrie, Kyrie just going off and torching the Warriors and averaging thirty eight a game and doing what he did. I mean, House, I have never in my life seen somebody, and this is not a denigration because this is pure respect. I've never seen anyone make more terrible shots than he did in that Boston series. <laughs> He's just great at it. He makes 28 he, footers with a hand in his face. Like Even Curry's three-pointers aren't as ridiculous as Kyrie when Kyrie gets hot. They're ridiculous, and he makes them all the time. 
So I don't know. I think 12 to 1 is interesting for him. What do you think, House? I, I like it. The problem I have with Kyrie is you, that means he has to jump over um, LeBron, and LeBron, I expect, if the Cavs win, will be playing both ways. So we're going to have two or three or maybe five unbelievable defensive plays that right. will be I fresh in our, in our minds. And, and we're not going to get any defensive plays out of Kyrie, which is why, even though 12-1 to 1 is good. So I have a little menu, as, I, as I'm as wont oh. to do. You know, I'm inclined mm. to allocate a little capital this time of year. Yeah. The one that I like is Draymond at um, plus 800. Okay. And the theory there is that Steph and KD cancel each other out, and Draymond basically has a final se- series just like he had last year. He just has to, like, r- replicate – you know, being uh, meaningful in the five different categories that he's capable of doing. And then, um, you know, Steph and KD will trade games um, under this theory yeah. of, of, you know, l- leading the, he- the hedge. The hedge, so I, that's one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play Draymond at the plus 800. I'm also thinking about a nice parlay. I like KD yeah. pl- alongside with the Warriors in five. So that's my hedging P word play. If yeah. it's the Warriors in five, KD um, at the, as, as, as kind of leading the way because on balance the Warriors will, will defer to him. They've demonstrated that. I mean, that's why I think we've seen the very best Steph, postseason Steph ever. It's because he is the healthiest he's been in the postseason, and that's because of, of Kevin Durant's impact on the team over the course of the regular season. But I think in this finals, KD's first taste of this um, with with this group. I know that he played as a young guy yeah, for the Thunder, he but this, he has an expectation of winning. I think there, though, there's kind of a, you could talk yourself into deferring. So KD at plus 200, Warriors in five at plus 240. The parlay calculator says that's a 9-1 to one bet. That's a nice plus 920. I think KD is the. if you think the Warriors are winning, I think KD is the best bet because he'd have to guard LeBron and he's going to have to protect the rim and you know they're they're really going to need him because rim protection last year, if you remember, when they had especially when they had to play Azili and who was the other guy they had to throw out there? I'm blanking now. After Bogut, they'd throw a couple guys out there that were uh, that were uh, not great. And the, the craziest thing in the series is both teams. It might just be both teams playing seven guys. Because they're going to have all the rest from it, you know? And, like, in game one, I think the Cavs could get away with playing seven guys. They're not playing again until uh, Sunday. They'd have three days off. And I think the Cavs have to win game one. If we talk about what the media wants to happen, yeah. KD feels feels right. Feels yeah, that, oh, that's a good angle. What What does the media want for stories from game one? KD sucking would be their number one choice, right? So then he can then he can come then he can then the, the redemption of KD in game two. But to uh, to the Draymond MVP theory, yeah, there would there could after what happened last year, yeah, in the finals, he there could be the finals for them. an annoying but powerful Draymond grows up. Oh, storyline! It like ain't the one. I love it, Brian Curtis. <laughs> Draymond grows up. Or Draymond Dr- grows up 8-1. to one. Let's do this. Or the flip side of it, Draymond can't grow up after game three <laughs> when he gets tossed for getting into a fight with Dante Jones. Yeah, I think... So let's try to guess all the narratives, right? Seven game series, we'll say. Game one, Cavs win. Durant's underwhelming. Uh, Katie's a loser. Katie, he that's why he went to the Warriors, because he knew he wasn't good enough. He's not as good as LeBron. LeBron owns KD. That's game one. Good. Game two, Durant scores 48 points, chip on his shoulder. KD grew up. This is the game. This is the transformation game for him. My time is now. This is it's, my title. This is his time. Yeah, he just showed he showed that he's important. Game three, the Kyrie Irving 49 point game. They can't <laughs> stop Kyrie. This is unbelievable. The Cavs are gonna win. House, do you like all this so far? Yeah, I like it. I'm okay. enjoying it. Uh, game four, Cavs, Cavs are going to win. They, they, they're going to win in five or six. The Warriors are done. Mike Brown. Oh, Mike Brown gets killed after game three. <laughs> Mike Brown. Oh, my God. Steve Kerr. Could Steve Kerr come back? Mike Brown's ruining this series. Game four, Steph hits like Steph and Clay hit like twenty eight threes. You ignore Steph Curry at your peril. Yeah, remember Steph Curry. Oh, I yeah, love remember it. Steph Curry. I love it. Now it's two two going back to the Golden State for Game five. They win Game five. It's a classic. Both teams are great. 
Now it's like greatest series ever. Ooh, yeah. Greatest ever. That's best that, ever. That's when that comes the in. Best ever. <laughs> that's uh, game five. Game six. Warriors up early. Draymond does something dumb. Oh, history repeats itself. LeBron puts up like the 49, 11, and 16. LeBron's the game six narratives. LeBron's the best. Lebr- we forgot about LeBron. LeBron wouldn't allow his team to lose. Yeah. Not on his floor. Not on, not on my floor. Can Mike Brown control Draymond at the worst possible time? <laughs> and then it goes seven. It's going seven, House. I can see St- it now. And Steve Kerr back to the bench for yeah, game Steve seven. Steve Kerr back. Steve Kerr back. One I'm game. Going seven. Coaches one game. I'm going seven. And then we go into seven. It's like they've won there before. They've already won a seven on the road. They have the best player for one game. It's trouble. We'll see. The, the, the Warriors, are the, they've never really beaten LeBron and Kyrie together. How about the Steve Kerr, Willis Reed walkout in game seven? <laughs> He's he's so here. Good. He's he's got his little chalkboard. He's here. Uh, that'd be unbelievable. Uh, quick break to talk about Miller Lite, the official sponsor of the Ringer.com, my official beer since I was in college in the late '80s. They're brewed not to just to taste great, but also to be less filling. Only 96 calories. It won't fill you up. It's brewed to be enjoyed from tip off to final buzzer. It's the original light beer and has been since we first showed up courtside in 1975. I'm saying we. Because I've been on the Miller Lite team ever since they did the Red Arback, Casey Jones, Satch Sanders, Sam Jones, that whole poster. It's in the Ringer studio. Anyway, Miller Lite, the official sponsor of the Ringer.com. All right, House, did I talk you into seven games or no? You still say sweep? I'm going to root for seven games, but I'm also I'm going to gamble on a sweep. I will say I think LeBron with rest is that's a legit thing. The fact, I think he's going to be awesome in game one. Another th- two, two and a half days till game two. It's good. It's, it's it, the, the way this is spaced out with these 18 days for seven games is perfect for him. All right, House, we're letting you go. Fantastic. Um, I, will, I will talk to you by text as we try to figure out what to do. When are you getting invited on Cousin Sal's pod? Are your feelings hurt? I don't yet? know. He's done three. I, well, the U.S. Open's right around the corner. Yeah, and I'm already formulating some points of view. In fact, uh, quick plug for the Shack House: we have uh, noted Miller Lite aficionado Kevin Kisner on today's <laughs> podcast. Kevin Kisner just won the Dina DeLuca uh, Invitational down okay. in Fort Worth, Texas. Great. And we also are going to talk a lot of Tiger on today's Shack House. So okay, uh, be sure to check that out. Try not to get fired. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. All right, before we talk about Frank DeFord, what is worse than having lousy sheets? I remember being in college and trying to prolong the same set of sheets for weeks because I didn't feel like doing laundry. I still have nightmares about it. Guess what? Great sleep starts with the right sheets, and they're more affordable than you think. With Bowl and Branch, they make the most comfortable sheets you'll ever sleep on. Fall asleep faster, sleep deeper, wake up ready to kick some ass. Each sheet is crafted from 100% organic cotton. Feel incredible, look amazing. And since Bowl and Branch sells exclusively online, there's no expensive retail markup. Half the price, twice the quality. Anyone who sleeps on Bowl and Branch sheets loves them. That's why they have thousands of five-star reviews, raves in the New York Times and Forbes. Even three U.S. presidents have Bowl and Branch sh- uh, sheets. Go to bowlandbranch.com today. You'll get $50 off your first set of sheets, plus free shipping when you use the promo code BS. Try them for 30 nights. If you're not impressed, return them for a full refund. $50 off plus free shipping right now at bowlandbranch.com. We called Jonathan Charks and his phone was, it was too spotty and the connection wasn't good enough. So we, we unfortunately had to cut that. And we're, he's going to be on the Ringer NBA show on Wednesday. He has a big piece about Kevin Durant coming out this week on the Ringer. And he was a huge part of our NBA draft guide. So I'm going to have him back on when we have a better um, phone connection. But the two things he told us was he thought that, uh, that the Cavs were going to get uh, going to attack the Warriors big guys and that he thought the series could go six. But listen to him on Ringer NBA show if you want to hear the thing. Sorry about the uh, phone connection. All right, Brian Curtis and I are going to talk about Frank DeFord and then we're going to close it. So first of all, it was, it was the timing was weird. Memorial Day, um, which is a day we're just thinking about, uh, you know, kind of thinking backwards, thinking about all the people that served the country and people that lost their lives, all this stuff. And you're already in kind of that, not nostalgic, what's the, what's the right word? 
Yeah. Uh, Nostalgic. Sad. I don't know. So it's always a strange day. It's always weird that it's a holiday. Kind of a fugue state. Yeah. Yeah. And then DeFord dies in the morning, West Coast time, um, which I, I had heard rumors that his health wasn't great, but didn't know um, it was that bad. You had him on the on the podcast, what, a year ago that we ran on Channel 33? Last summer, I want to say. Was his health okay when you talked to him? It seemed like it was, right? Yeah. And he was always kind of, he'd had problems over the last couple of years. You would see, he would say, I, I remember calling him one time. So I had pneumonia. I'm just out of the hospital. Yeah. And I was calling him about some stupid thing. I was like, are you okay to do this? Oh yeah, I'm fine. I'm yeah, fine. Yeah. And then he talked for 45 minutes in perfect paragraphs Yeah, and everything was quotable and it was, it was Frank DeFord. Yeah. So I was, I've been thinking about it for the last 24 hours and I, I read a lot of the pieces, including your excellent one on the ringer. And, uh, you know, I just think that era of journalism where, somebody wrote a piece and if it was the right person, it became an event in itself, I think is gone for sports. The the stuff is too fast. It's too furious. Uh, no movie analogy on that, but, uh, it's just, it's just coming too fast. There's so many takes, there's so much writing. And even if somebody has an awesome piece that might even command the landscape for a day, the difference with DeFord and just that era and how we consume stuff and read stuff is like, he had a piece. It was like a five day event, you it know, it came week. out. Yeah. It was like, Oh my God. Oh, DeFord has a piece in SI and it was, you read it and go to school, talk about it with friends. And it just, in, in the magazine itself would live on for days. Maybe you go back three days later, read it again. We didn't have a lot as nearly as many reading options back then. He was the best. I think there was certainly a point I would say from 76 to 84 it was just undisputed. Every, every big feature that he wrote was the most important feature anyone wrote that month. And I don't see that happening again. Do you? I think we still have events, but they're really short as you say. Yeah. Right. Thompson piece, uh, goes from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. And then it's, and, and then, then, it's we, off and the then we begin and he to does move a couple on. of TV shows and it's done. And then we say, oh, it's on dead spin. You know, right. We just kind of lose the train of thought. <laughs> Uh, you know, a, a big sports illustrated feature, but nothing, nothing like the DeFord and later Gary Smith and later Rick Riley when he would do a big feature yes. that would just grab you by the lapels, I feel, and shake you all week. Also having the, per having it on paper because you'd keep it around yeah, and then maybe go open it the next day again. It's, I want to, I want to read this again, or I want to, I have it on my nightstand. It felt more permanent in a way than when pieces that, do now. When he did the coach about, what was his name? Bull Sullivan. Toughest coach there ever was. Toughest coach ever was, and it was the cover story. I, I, I mean, I remember getting that in the mailbox and going, "Oh my god, <laughs> the, the Ford's on the cover!" Like it, it was substantial. It really mattered. And then you go through. It's like, oh, this is look how long this is. I got to carve out forty-five minutes. What's the what's the forty-five minutes I'm going to devote to this? Pace myself and be just in the right frame of mind, so I'm yeah. ready for it. Yeah, and there were a lot of people doing it, and I don't think he was necessarily the best, right? Like, the ceiling of his writing was the highest, but I think he was the best at it for 10 years. I still think Mark Cram's piece about Frazier and Ali, the third fight, is the best thing I ever read in that magazine. And I think there were guys that had as much talent as DeFord, but I think the time, um, the execution, the people that he picked, he was really smart at picking high profile, important people and writing about them, which I think is, is probably the thing that, that prevented Gary Smith from being remembered that same way. Like Gary Smith's, a lot of his best pieces were pretty, pretty obscure subjects, you know? And Frank DeFord was like, I'm writing about Bill Russell and I'm, I'm writing Jimmy about Connors. Bobby Knight and Jimmy Connors and Arthur Ashe and all these big, 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 important people. But let's not forget that DeFord did have this kind of, kitschy Americana thing going oh, yeah. on because that coach in Mississippi, as he says in the first line of that piece, nobody's ever heard of. Right. None of us have ever heard of. He did roller derby. He did a sports Illustrated piece. Refresh my memory bill on jeopardy. He did one on Miss America, which I think became a book. He, he had this thing where he, he also Billy Khan was, he, was he, a strange, that was what 35, 40 years that after. Was, and that was kind of a nostalgia zone piece, but he also did one but about, we, I didn't know who Billy oh, Khan no, was. No, yeah. Yeah. Gonna, I won't claim that I did. He also did one about traveling with his family around Florida. I think those, he went to all the crappy roadside attractions with his family. Like he loved, he had a side of him too. That was like, I'm going to go just Frank DeFord up this thing right. in American culture. 
and bring all the kind of weird power to it. It was it was weird. It was it was a funny. He wrote twenty books. It said in the obit twenty he wrote twenty books because there's all these books you don't even you don't even know existed. Novels. I think Miss oh, America yeah, yeah. became a book. I, I we were saying you, you were reading Miller Lite ad. Frank DeFord was big enough that he was in a Miller Lite ad right. with Billy Martin. Tastes great, less filling, and shameless enough that he wrote a book about the Miller Lite Tastes Great campaign. Like, I mean, think of that. Amazing. Think of that guy. I mean, he was just. I was also struck by looking at pictures of him and stuff. The sports writer who not only tells us how to write, by example, we can't be that good, but to, but shows us, but also how to act, yeah, how to dress, how to carry yourself as this kind of like character out of some like movie. Right. He bridged the two eras from the uh, the 50s, 60s era of the sports writer to what, which, you know, you pointed out in your piece, but like the by the time the 80s rolled around, um, there were, you had inside sports was also doing a lot of the same great stuff for only for two and a half years. But that was the first time I really felt like all these, and I was at the right age group for it too, but I just felt like these guys are my heroes. Like Frank DeFord, um, Gary Smith, Riley comes in in the mid eighties, like, who's this guy? Oh. And then he write, writes some of it. Then it's, he immediately gets <laughs> jumps on that side. Um, that's when the best American sports writing book started to take off and before, before it turned into a self parody. Uh, but the eighties, I think were the best era for here's a big ass, well-written piece. And this is important. And you're going to think about it for a couple of days. Yes. And that could, that could command your attention. Cause what, what people who are younger than us, Bill don't remember is those days there was local media, Yeah, your sports page. And then there was national media. Now every, we're all national now. There's like barely any local left. We're all national writers. But then it was an elect, right? If you were DeFord, Curry, Kirkpatrick, Riley in that in that Sports Illustrated, Alexander Wolf, Jack McCallum, you really had you'd made it to this tier that no one else had. You and had if you were really power. good at it, like Frank DeFord was and Riley was, whoa. Right. You were on this Olympus. Yeah, I remember when Frank DeFord wrote about Joe Delaney in the early eighties. Cause Joe Delaney drowned trying to save these two kids, but couldn't swim. And it's a story I just wouldn't have known if he didn't write about it. You know, there, there was an incredible amount of power that sports illustrated inside sports during the couple of years specifically had where if they shone their light on somebody, it pushed them to a whole different level of recognize recognizability. Joe Delaney was this running back who died. Lots of people died in the seventies and eighties. And it was like, Oh, this is sad. The guy drowned. Then DeFord wrote about it. And now he's like, I love Joe Delaney. I still love him 35 years later. And it's the story's incredible. And that was the power those magazines had. Now, if that Joe Delaney thing happens, there's probably three different features written about him in the first year. And it's, it's TV. He just becomes the latest. Oh, here's another thing, and it's it goes through the vortex. The kind thirty of. for thirties in production already, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're we're off and running. It's like oh, here's some here's some content, which you know obviously we're we're part of too, and we're always looking for good stories, and, and that's awesome. It's great. You don't have to wait. It's great. My point is, in the eighties, we didn't have that, and something like Joe Delaney, there's probably twenty five other stories that that were probably as good as that or as interesting or stuff that would have resonated with us. And they just kind of went away. We should also talk about his, the fact that he picked basketball as his first big sport at SI is huge. Gets to SI. I was looking through his memoir last night yeah. and nobody at the magazine knows what basketball is almost at all. And he goes to them and goes, it's Hey, an there's, irrelevant sport for there's the this part. guy named Bill Bradley at Princeton where I just graduated from yeah. who we should probably do a piece about. And he does it. And then he goes and does the NBA. And there's that great, I, I borrowed that anecdote from his thing. He's on a plane doing a cover story on John Havlicek. And um, Havlicek is sitting in coach. And Frank DeFord, a 20-something writer for Sports Illustrated, is sitting in first class. And Havlicek has to come to first class to be interviewed by Frank DeFord. Right. I mean, that's like the in steerage on the Titanic. It's like Leo on the Titanic coming up to, to, to see Kate Winslet. I mean, that's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. When I, when I did my basketball book, which I spent three years on and the first year and a half, just reading everything. And at that point, the SI vault was there so I could go back and I had some of the old SIs too, but it was really hard to find anything from the mid late sixties, early seventies, stuff like that. I was astonished by how many NBA pieces he wrote. 
mean, he basically was there for Bill Russell's last couple years at SI and then going all the way through. And then eventually people like John Papanek and Kirk Kirkpatrick, people like that started to write about it. But it's, it's, they're little snapshots of not just who mattered at the time, but also some of the, some of the issues that America had at the time, you know, the, uh, the Connors piece, which is the fa- my favorite piece that he ever wrote, is probably a piece that would get somebody in trouble now. A, ma- a man raised by two women to conquer man. I'm sure people would be like, well, why does it blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so he is, when you reread some of those, it, they definitely feel era specific. Yes. And he, he also was much better. He, he, I think I think I borrowed this line for he, he's a better marathoner than he was a sprinter. Yeah, no question. If he had to, like, when he, he wrote, more crank columns than any smart person I've ever seen. Whether it was, he was like the world's most, uh, the world's best credentialed soccer troll. Right. And he just kept coming out. You find like old issues of SI and he's just killing soccer. And you're like, what is he doing? Yeah. He did, uh, the, the reinvention of DeFord. So he leaves SI in the late 90, in the late eighties to go form the national. And there's a great book about the history of Sports Illustrated that I re- I highly recommend. That has a long chapter about DeFord leaving, and there was a, really a lot of bitterness. Yes, I mean on the level of like me leaving ESPN level of bitterness with him in SI. Where Definitely, he was like persona non grata, and uh, they like took a million dollars from. He was like owed. He felt about like a million dollars. Yeah, of promised money, and they wouldn't give it to him. And, and they were. Um, this is Michael McCambridge as the franchise. Yeah, and he book. was he and he was also going after SI writers, which they I think they felt like was totally uncalled for. Goes to the National has unlimited money to spend, and <laughs> for eighteen months, for eighteen months, and assembles his great writing staff. And it was I can't even describe how great that newspaper was when we were forming Grantland in two thousand eleven. And I really want to do some oral histories. And that was the first one. It was like the first one we were doing is the national because I have yet to read anything that captured how important that and influential that newspaper was. And also how crazy it was that it failed because of a bad business plan, (laughs) not because it was good. And we ended up getting this awesome oral history. And he felt, I, I think part guilty, but also part still incredulous that it was such a disaster where you know, like unpaid bills and just oh. crazy, crazy, crazy stories. But yet he had a great eye for talent and assembled a bunch of awesome people. A lot of whom went on to have big careers afterwards. I'm amazed that Charles P. Pierce, our old pal, and Chris Mortensen were both touched by Frank DeFord. Right. Just think how different those two people are. I mean, they're on the opposite sides of the moon. Yeah, seriously. And he, he had a hand in all of them. This literary godfather. He, he had, that was his Dick Shap period. We talked about Shap on the pod a few weeks ago. Right. That was his Shap period. He also, he he did some ESPN stuff before. I remember Walsh told me a story once about how um, he, and he became very friendly with DeFord and DeFord was doing like ESPN commentaries or whatever. And then, and DeFord would always say to him, I don't understand why, uh, why HBO isn't using SI people. Cause they were owned by the same company at that point. And then all of a sudden real sports is like, Hey, we're going to use Frank DeFord and grab them. And then he had like this third act. He's doing NPR commentaries. He's doing uh real sports. He's kind of reinvented himself as this older, as you said, a little curmudgeonly. Um, and the stuff that he did on Brian Gumbel show, I always loved him. He was on. It was great. They had like a great interaction. He was always like offended by Bryant for a second. Oh, I don't know about that, Bryant. <laughs> like Bryant would be like, and Frank, you spent time with this guy. And then you really thought, oh, no, I'm not saying that, Bryant. And they would just kind of go at it. I always enjoyed it. But they were all in awe of him on that show. And, and with reason. Because he was he was the, you know, the great generational talent. And he was a little older. Yeah. And, and he looked the part. He looked like an actor hired to play with the pocket square and the yeah. slick back hair slick and the back mustache. Hair. My mom always thought he was super handsome. She's like, "Oh, you got to set me up with Frank DeFord." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and in the my N- nephew the, laughed at that one. The NPR thing blows me away. Yeah, because sixteen hundred commentaries, sixteen hundred, and people all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, who don't know anything about sports, don't care about sports, don't want to know about sports. Go, oh, I love that Frank DeFord. Yeah, I mean, if you can be one of those guys who 
bolts out of sports and touches people like the only other i mean there, there are a couple of people riley probably did it for a little while red smith was kind yeah. of the classic like oh he's so worldly he's so smart turned such a good phrase that was frank on npr he was for people that didn't give a shit about any of this stuff he was their voice he was their way into sports i think you made a good point earlier about how the difference between local and national and how split it was yeah because I remember when ESPN hired me in 2001 and I asked for like five weeks off to try to figure out how to write a national column because the roadmap at that point was just local columns. And I think Riley had his SI column at that point, but it was 800 words. It was done a specific way. I didn't want to do an imitation of that, but I really had trouble figuring it out and had to map out all these different ways, things that I thought might work to try to get people outside of my little sphere, which is basically Boston to care because that's how people, people wrote sports columns. If you're in Boston, you wrote mostly about Boston sports. If you're in Chicago, you wrote mostly about Chicago. And if, even if you wrote national, you tied in the local sports as the connection. Sure. And now it's the opposite. And, but anyway, the, 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 uh, the thing with the Ford is he was the national guys for us was basically a side. And, and inside it, sports for two and a half years and the national for 18 months and Rudy Martsky. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't, we didn't have a, there wasn't a lot of sports writing connections for if you're in Texas and I'm in Boston and we start talking about sports writing, we only had like six guys to talk about. We weren't reading the same guys. No, no. You'd be like, Hey, I t I, did you read uh what was his name? Blackie Sherrod. Blackie Sherrod. Yeah. Blackie Sherrod. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have read one piece. And I would be like, did you read Ray Fitzgerald? You're like, no. Who? Okay. okay. Who? Frank DeFord, yeah. Did you read the Bobby Knight piece? Yeah. And then we're talking. And it's funny how people solve that problem, right? You you ultimately solved it by just writing about Boston anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I and, had to. And also doing movies and other things. I did pop culture, yeah. Riley solves it by doing heartstring tugging little stories. Like, here's a universal thing a lot, right? Yeah. And then he writes about Tiger and John Elway. And, and Sammy and, Sosa and was a big Sure, one. and that was a yeah. big one. But he would also do like, here's a story you've never heard. Yeah. And I'm going to grab you with this one. But yeah, I mean it was a big deal to be that that strapping national guy. I mean, DeFord also just like, you know, he, you, you mentioned real sport. He just had this career where he kind of followed his nose around. Yeah. And he was seemingly open to anything. The other thing we should say about him is he was also a nice guy. Everybody I, liked him. To me, he was a nice guy. And then I read all the things and I was like, oh, he answered the phone for everybody. Yeah. He, people would send him crappy articles they wrote as a kid and he'd send back, somebody said six type pages, I think it was Karen Krause of the Times, of critiques. I mean, this is a guy who was a huge writer and was busy. Yeah. And he was bothering to do that. It makes you want to answer your email, doesn't it? When some when somebody writes an email and says, hey, man, can you read my stories? And you go, oh, no, this again. But he did all that stuff for a lot of people. In like 2005, ESPN ran a, ran a documentary about Frank DeFord, which I think was called You Write Better Than You Play. <laughs> and they had done it before with Dick Schapp which I think that one was called In His Own Words. That was awesome. And I remember hearing about the DeFord one and going, oh, they can do the Dick Schaap thing with DeFord? Like, that's not cool. Like, the Dick Schaap thing was great. You can't do that again. And then they did it with DeFord. It was awesome. And a big part of it was about his daughter who had cystic fibrosis. And she passed away, I think, when she was eight. And about how that affected him and his career and it was really well done and i went to look for it on uh online yesterday and it's just there's no trace of it so i would love to see uh espn at some point i'm sure they have space on espn too um they should run the deford thing and they should run the the shap thing again because those were both awesome and especially for deford uh it's really affecting and it's good and it puts his career in the proper perspective because not many guys touch that many big athletes yeah. And also we're from that sixties tone that really I mean, you saw Poznansky like writing a big piece yesterday. When I, I say like in the, my thing that Dan Jenkins and, and DeFord were hired the same year at SI, which is a miracle. Yeah. And Dan was much older, but the um and much more experienced. But like those guys really set the tone, I feel, for the next generation that came after them. All those guys like Lupa kind of those they looked at those two. Yeah. And wanted to be kind of one of those two guys. Yeah. Dan was a deadline writer. Give me, give me the ball. Masters just ended. Give me the rock. I, I, I got this. You know, I'm gonna sit down on my typewriter in an hour, write the best story you ever read. Frank was more immersive. I'm gonna go find who the real Jimmy Connors is. You know, Dan wouldn't care about that. 
and and they set two different kind of paths. Yeah, and, they, and they both inspired some of the worst sports writing of all time, too. We should mention that. People imitating that. <laughs> Horrible, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, I think in Frank's case, at least, he wrote so plainly. You mentioned this. I mean, it's like he, he read his pieces. You don't feel like you're reading super highfalutin language. They're super plain. They're super, they're not. It was very, it was very tight. He, he was so clever he how was, he was able to just, just do these very simple, but brilliant sentences and just put them all together in all this detail. And you'd be like, Whoa, he was very accessible. Yes. Oh, it wasn't, yes. uh, there, were, there are were other guys who tried to do the fancy DeFord impersonations that, you know, four paragraphs of nothing start in the feature just to, to, uh, flex their literary muscles and DeFord net. He didn't really do that much of that. No, oh, you mentioned was, Mark Cram. That's the guy on the other side of the world from Frank DeFord. Yeah, but Mark Cram was probably the best at that version. He could do that version. I mean, then Frank yeah. Frank reads like a guy who spent his formative years at Time Inc. Yeah, don't blow people away. This is a national magazine for the masses. Yeah, don't don't write over people's heads. Some of my favorite Haberstam stuff, and they both use the same trick where they didn't really rely on quotes, mm -hmm. and they spent a lot of time with somebody and then wrote what they thought the person and they just framed it in a, in a way where it's not like, and then he said this, and then here's the next quote. It, they didn't do that. If they used quotes, it was always sparingly and they might use one sentence. And, and Frank would find the best quotes. Yeah. He would find this killer thing. Uh, you know, I had the one in there when Bill Russell kind of comes out of Exile, 1999. And oh, he wrote yeah. a piece that won the National Magazine Award, I think. And Tommy Heinsohn said he won 11 titles in 12 years. And they <laughs> named the fucking tunnel for Ted Williams. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's some, and I remember reading that and going, whoa. And that was yes. a throwback to Ford. It was. Ford, I mean, it, he was kind of coming out of exile. I mean, how old was he died when he was, he was 78 when he died? So he was probably like 60 when he wrote that, which is pretty, pretty late for he a and, I remember the whole theme of the piece was he and Russell were old men. Yeah. And, and kind of reconnecting after a time. Well, he was a great writer and, uh, and he just obviously an inspiration to anybody who, who does this for a living, but just in general, just a great writer at a great point for that magazine. I feel, you know, 75 to 84 is probably the best, the, the stretch when the SI mattered the most because it reached the most people more people cared about sports there's more sports to write about and watch on tv the writing yeah. was better there was more of a connection it had more of a place it had less competition and uh you know the cover would come out and it was just the one picture on the cover with the one title and it really mattered who was on the cover and uh and he was the guy for them so uh it was awesome so anyway there was some people wrote some good pieces there's good links to some of this stuff i love the connor's one I think the Moses one is a really interesting reread as we discussed for a lot of different reasons. I think the Bobby Knight, the rabbit hunter is an all timer. Ooh. Uh, the one he wrote about Russell, but it really it's, there's 20, 25 pieces that you can reread depending on what you care about. And, and I think, uh, you know, you're not going to be disappointed, right? Absolutely. Oh no. Yeah. There's, there are very few bad reads. They're almost all pretty great. The, the only take that I hate was like, he created the hashtag long form. It's like, oh. I, I just hate hashtag long, long form. No offense to don't Don't smear, people, don't smear his legacy. It's, it's like long form started 10 years ago. It was like long form, Sports Illustrated started long form in 1954. But before that, I just don't like the word. It's just writing's good writing. It's so dumb. It could be 8,000 words. It could be 800 words. Like, you don't need to be like long form. Like, this is some... Basically, long form means it's going to take a lot of time to read this piece. Yes, and I was about to say that. I don't think, I don't think, I would never say Frank Frank DeFord's articles were great because they were long. You could long form. I, yeah. It's just <laughs> they were just the good. Reason. Yeah. I was just, I never liked when people would call Grantland a long form site because it was like, so how do you explain the the Dave Jacoby's reality columns and the <laughs> bad quarterback league and all the other stuff we were doing? Like that stuff wasn't long form. Anyway, uh, he was just a good writer and had a huge influence on a lot of people RIP to him that is it for the BS podcast thanks to Brian Curtis thanks Bill you were a little bit almost on the DL we we coaxed a good performer you're a little sick it's sorry I'm on just a little allergy ridden voice apologies to the audience thanks to Bowen Branch for sponsoring today's podcast great sleep starts with the right sheets they're more affordable than you think with Bowen Branch go to bowenbranch.com today to get their 100% organic cotton crafted sheets and you'll get 50% off your first set of sheets plus free shipping 
when you use the promo code BS. You happy with your sheets, Brian? At, at, now I am, but at age early thirties, late twenties, college, it was a mess. College, it was man, gross. Oh my god, that would be a good documentary. It's just people's sheets in college. How disgusting <laughs> they are! Just all of you should get Bowen Branch, nephew Kyle. How are your How are your sheets? Not as good as they could be. Oh, uh, nephew Kyle needs Bowen Branch sheets. Uh, thanks to Credit Wise from Capital One. Kyle, how's your credit? Just got a Capital One credit card, actually. Great. The free app uh, <laughs> lets you track the factors that make up your credit health using information from your TransUnion credit report. You can check it anytime without negatively impacting your credit. Download CreditWise today. Are you doing a Channel 33 pod this week, possibly? I might. Might? All right. Check out Brian's doing some really good. What was your favorite Channel 33 media podcast you've done so far? Ooh. Uh, well, you don't have to pick. I, I'm a shoe, I mean, I always defer to Shoemaker on, on Trump and wrestling. I mean, that's, you know, right, so David and I have a conversation in any form. It's great. Uh, Curtis is on Channel 33, sports, media, politics, the intersection of all three. The press box is the what press we're calling box it. Finally. is what we're calling it. Yeah, we have that. I have a title for that. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to Larry Wilmore's new podcast. Don't forget about uh, Cousin Sal's new podcast as well. Don't forget to go to TheRinger.com, and we'll be back on the BS Podcast later this week. <laughs>